Today on episode 66, I have a special guest with me, and we are going to talk about effectively and purposefully integrating educational technology into your teaching so that it's not just about the tech, it's about the learning. Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kim LaPree, and this is the podcast for new and beginning teachers who don't want to just survive those first few years, but actually thrive. I really appreciate you coming out and hanging out with me today. As I mentioned, I have an awesome, awesome guest, and I was fangirling a little bit about it because I have been following this person for a while and her name is Jennifer Gonzalez and she is over at the Cult of Pedagogy. Now that's both a website and a podcast and I have followed that podcast for many many years. I've binge listened to it and she just has so much amazing insight that really helped me as a teacher. And I was really honored to have her as a guest on the show. And we're going to be talking about technology. Now, for a lot of us, you know, we know that we're supposed to have technology in our teaching, but we may not necessarily know what that looks like aside from having the tech be like a digital binder or a digital textbook or, you know, really big calculator. How can we use technology in a way that really transforms the learning so that our students are having these experiences that they wouldn't have otherwise? How can we use technology so that it also makes our lives easier as teachers and also becomes a great communication tool with students and parents? Now, I want you guys to stay until the end of the episode because Jennifer is going to talk about a resource that she has that's going to be extremely valuable for you as a new teacher. Because one of the things that sometimes we either get caught up in is either being overwhelmed by how much tech is out there or we become obsessed with all of the new tech. And so Jennifer has, like I said, a resource that's going to teach you some processes in terms of thinking about which tech to use, which is the most effective technology out there. And I don't want you to miss out on that. So be sure to stay until the end of the episode. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Jennifer, for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. Now, for my listeners who have never heard of you, could you please tell us about your teaching experience and how you came to your current position? Sure. Um, I started off as a middle school language arts teacher, and I did that for seven to eight years, depending on how you measure summer types of things. Um, <laughs> and then uh, when I, I stayed home to have kids for a couple of years, and during that time, I started working at the college level. Um, preparing pre-service teachers. So I worked with student teachers, people just entering the College of Education, um, just undergrads of all different levels of, of the program. Um, so I did that for a couple of years and I really loved it. And I realized that if I wanted to do that seriously, I was going to have to probably get a doctorate. Um, so I kind of had the choice between taking the academic path or something else. And around that time, I was also learning some technology. I was learning how to blog for a course I was taking and I just really, really loved it. And I went kind of above and beyond in the courses I was taking and I realized it was just something I really liked to do. So I kind of combined the work I was doing preparing teachers with the tech and I decided that I wanted to keep doing what I was doing at the university level, but kind of for everybody else in the world. Cool. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, and I never ended up going back to the classroom because this work takes up so much time and there was so yes. much to learn about it. Uh, and when I was an English teacher, I mean, that was like a 70 hour a week job. So yeah. <laughs> um, I figured I could do one or the other. And so I've just been doing this full time now at Cult of Pedagogy for um, six years now. Oh, wow. Um, you had mentioned that you worked with new teachers, which is something that I aspire to do at the university level. And I was thinking, you know, one aspect of teaching that a lot of new teachers worry about is using technology in their teaching. And so they may or may not have had instruction on ed tech in their programs, and some don't even know how it could benefit their teaching and their students. So why do you think that they should definitely be using tech in some form as a teacher? 
So I think there are actually a lot of different reasons, but probably the ones that I think are the most important in this day and age um, are one is that it just makes a lot of things more efficient. I think teachers who don't use any technology a lot of times do a lot of the same things that teachers who do use it do, but it takes them five times as long. So right. hand hand grading things, for example, assessments. Um, and so the efficiency is one reason. Um, another reason is that tech can provide experiences that are really not possible without the technology. For example, what we're doing right now, right. we live in completely different places and we're able to have a whole conversation sort of face to face. Um, Skype actually provides crazy, ridiculously cool experiences. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then also, I think at this point, we owe it to our students to build their capacity to use technology. Um, if they're not getting their hands on stuff, um, they might end up being well-versed in literature and have great vocabularies and be really good in math, but they're really not going to function very well in the workplace or even at the university level if they don't know how to function in uh, a technologically rich environment. And so, um, you know, even if a teacher is resistant to it, we owe it to our kids to give them those tools. Right. And then, you know, there's the other end of the spectrum where there's some teachers who are super duper techie and they love to try out every new tool that comes out all the time. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on this for new teachers. So, yeah, if a new teacher is just like really into all the things and all the tools, um, you know, I, and I'm going to get into this actually in a few minutes, but I do have kind of a process that I recommend for teachers that, you know, a lot of times when we go to conferences, we hear people say that you need to put the learning first and put the tech second. And so that just as a general rule um, is is great. And I have a process that I recommend mm -hmm. that teachers use. But um, I think, you know, for any teacher, trying stuff out is fine. But um, if you're noticing that implementing the technology is taking way longer than the actual learning Right. that's going on, that's sort of a good rule of thumb. You know, if, if it's not really paying off and it's taking way too much time, then it's probably um, not worth the time that it's taking. Now, how long do you think teachers should try it out? Because, you know, like when I try out something new, like Flipgrid, and I remember mm. thinking, oh, this is so much work. I don't know if mm -hmm. I want to do this, but I did give up. But there have been other tools where I tried it and then I was just like, this is too much work. And I wonder yeah. if I had persevered, if it would have worked out. Do you just have any recommendations for how long they should give it a try before they move on to something else? Well, one thing would definitely be to not experiment with a whole class of kids. I would <laughs> definitely experiment, you know, during your planning period, get two, two or three kids to come in at lunch and try things out with you, get your nieces and nephews, whatever it is. Um, but definitely don't make your first class period your trial <laughs> run. Um, know when it's like this is taking too long, have a backup plan. Um, and really just... Um, I don't know. That That's a tough question, honestly, because sometimes when you persevere just that little extra length of time, right? you know, it pays off. So I would definitely say practice when the kids are not there waiting around for, right. for, the, the, for the thing to start working. And then how do you pick which ones to use when there's just, I mean, there's an endless amount of apps mm -hmm. for, you know, grading and disseminating mm -hmm. assignments and things like that. How do we what are your recommendations for choosing the ones that we actually land on? So what I recommend actually is that teachers use uh, backward design to choose their technology. And for any of your listeners that are not really familiar with what that is, um, you know, a lot of times teachers plan instruction in terms of we say, OK, I'm going to cover this topic. I'm going to do the American Revolution for the next three weeks. Right. And then they just plan out activities and then they have some sort of a test at the end. And they probably when it comes to tech, they think, oh, it'll be fun for us to do this or be fun for us to do that. With backward design, for everybody who already knows that, you you think about what your goal is for the end of, say, the three-week unit. What should students be able to do by the time we're done right. and work backwards from that in terms of the kinds of learning they need to do in order to do well on that final assessment, whether it's a project or a test or something. At that point, you still haven't thought about technology yet. You're just right. thinking about it all kind of analog. Once you really have a good plan for learning in place, then start to think about the ways that the technology can enhance that. Can it make it more efficient? Can it provide an experience that we couldn't have without the technology? Are there ways that the tech can help students collaborate better with the plan that I already have in place? Right. Sometimes the answer is going to be no, no tech is necessary at all. Um, because sometimes, especially with something like Flipgrid, I think teachers are 
um, tempted to do it for like in place of a discussion, right. <laughs> but you might just be better off having kids do an actual face-to-face -face conversation and then you don't have 30 videos to grade later on. <laughs> um, plus kids need face-to-face -face interaction. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you really have your sort of learning goal as a guide post, you know, as a, as a guiding light at the end, then it can really help you decide as you go through, okay, that tech would be really cool, but it's not going to serve that end need. Right. Um, and so for this unit, you know, we can, we can skip that. And, you know, it's an imperfect process too. I think it's going to be a lot of trial and error. Some teachers are going to use a certain technology and realize a few days into it, oh, this is just, I need to, but it's like that with all teaching though, isn't it? Right. You know, we start <laughs> an activity and then we realize this is not going well at all. And it's probably best to, uh, to change course part way through as opposed to just like, you know, stubbornly like pushing through because that's what you decided to do and just be really transparent with your students and say, you know, how is this working for you guys? Right. If it's not going that well, let's, let's make a new plan because here's our goal at the end. So that's why it's really important to know what the learning goal is at the end, instead of just kind of randomly flailing around in this topic that you're covering. And, you know, you alluded to this where you're talking about how some teachers are like, where am I going to use the tech? And some teachers even, they're obsessed with being paperless. They're like, I am going to be mm. paperless no mm -hmm. matter what. And so they're using mm -hmm. tech for every single thing. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds to me from what you're saying that that's not, you don't think that's necessarily ideal either. I think it's a, I think it's a worthwhile goal. Um, you know, apart from just the environmental goal of being right. paperless, it's also just... Sometimes nowadays, if I write something on paper, then I have to find that piece of paper. It's not <laughs> cloud-based. And so you can become very dependent after a while on knowing that something is all synced up with all of your devices and, and that sort of thing. And, and um, so I think it's a worthwhile goal. I think that we can become way too perfectionistic about being paperless, though. Yeah. And because sometimes certain activities work better just on a whiteboard with dry erase markers or mm -hmm. just with actual physical post-it notes or people just scribbling out actual notes on regular paper. And so I think if a teacher is not going to be super rigid with themselves about that and realize that not only are certain activities better with just handheld tools, right. but certain people do better definitely with, you know, digital stuff. And I know, I mean, I'll go to conferences, I'll go to South by Southwest or ISTE and I write this tech guide every year. And I know that, you know, I'm probably expected to have some kind of like nice iPad with like an, an Apple pen, but I don't, I have a steno notebook and I scribble stuff out cause it's faster. I don't have to wait for stuff to load. And right. I don't like being on a device all the time because that's how we all are all the time. So plus my handwriting has gotten so bad that it worries <laughs> me. <laughs> like I literally physically cannot write words sometimes. So I think I need to stay in practice with that. And that's also one of the reasons why I still have my students do free writes on paper. Mm -hmm. I They yeah. need that physical aspect of it away from a screen too. Oh yeah, definitely. And, 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 and again, I'm just going to repeat the thing that the whole face to face thing is something we are, we're losing it rapidly. You know, sometimes there are people that I connect with online and I see them in person and they're just like, they don't even know how to make eye contact <laughs> right. anymore. So I think we're in trouble in that area. We need to always be looking for opportunities to just have regular conversations with each other. So, um, and I think that kind of can go along with paper and pen sometimes. Right. Yeah. Now, I also know, um, you know, some teachers, they are like, no, I'm only going to use paper. I'm only going to use post-its because mm -hmm. if I use technology, kids are going to misuse it. They're going to be distracted. Mm -hmm. They're going to goof off and message each other. Yeah. And I think that's kind of like an extreme end of yes. the conversation. So what are your thoughts on that? I think those things, I mean, it's a, it's a definite possibility because kids are going to screw around with whatever it is that we give them, you know? Um, and so that's, that's really just a classroom management issue right. more than anything. It's like, ha it's like fidget spinners or it's just like pencils. I had kids who would take their shoes off under their desk. Like they're going <laughs> to mess around with whatever you give them and they need to learn digital citizenship skills, just like they need to learn, you know, table manners. So, um, that's got to become part of the curriculum. It's got to become part of the classroom expectations. And, you know, there are, there are companies that have built their entire platforms on, babysitting students through their devices. Right. And so if a teacher in a school has the budget for that and they want to go that route, you can, you can have your, your desk there where you can see every single student's desktop. And, um, 
you know, that's one way of handling it. Not a lot of schools want to go that route. And, and it's more a matter of having a relationship with your students and, um, handling things on a case by case basis and talking to students about, you know, the consequences, not just you're going to get in trouble, but you're being disrespectful by misusing this technology in this way. Uh, and then also just not flipping out when things go wrong, you know, (laughs) it's just, it's just, it's kids being kids and we need to teach them how to use this technology. These are the tools of their lives. So, um, I guess it's a, a combination of a lot of different things that can, it is, help people deal with that problem. Yeah. And there are a lot of teachers um, at my site that are using Apple Classroom because Mm -hmm. they want to be able to see what Mm -hmm. is on every student's iPad. And I don't even know how to use it because I don't want to. The thought of trying to teach, staring at, you know, Apple Classroom and looking at their iPads and not being distracted by that. I think a lot Mm -hmm. of it also has to do with, like you said, relationships with your students and also your pacing. Like Mm. what is happening in your classroom that they have the opportunity to do that? Mm -hmm. So I feel like if your pacing is tight and you're monitoring and you're walking around the room and students are engaged, there isn't as many opportunities to misuse the technology. Right. And like, and you and I run the risk right now of sounding like, oh, this problem's never happened because I have such a great (laughs) relationship with my kids. And that's not what it is. The problems do still happen, but it's, Exactly. It's less likely if you're doing something really engaging, if they're doing something that is important and relevant to them right. and not just a digital worksheet. Um, and so it's it's part of the whole package. And I think sometimes that the same teachers who are so resistant to using technology for fear based reasons, those are maybe the same teachers who are afraid of letting the kids go to the bathroom during between classes or, you know, they, you know, Whatever it was, they might have freaked out about those little, you know, computer watches that people use, not computer watches, <laughs> the calculator watches yeah. that we used to have when I was a kid. And it's just like, there, it can't be a fear-based relationship. It can't be a gotcha culture in the classroom where it's just always about catching them doing something wrong. There needs to be something bigger and, and higher going on in your classroom than just trying to catch them doing something wrong. And assuming that they're yeah. all doing yeah. something wrong. Right, right. Yeah. Now, um, I've read your blog I listen to your podcast quite a bit. And I know that, as you had mentioned, you have a lot of experience of technology. And what I noticed is that you carefully pick and choose what to share in your blog and podcast. And you don't have every possible tech tool that's out there. So what do you think are the most impactful tools available that will help most teachers? I think that... um... I think if if I were a, a teacher just sort of getting started, you know, there are some universal uses that I think, and there are lots of tools that do these things. But, um, one thing I think all teachers, all people can benefit is having some kind of a good curation tool, something to collect, store, and organize all of the information that's out there. Um, and there are lots of, of things out there that people use, whether it's Padlet or they have like a, a blog feed reader or something, because we have so much information coming in that, um, finding a curation tool that works for you and then showing your students how to use it, using it to share information with your own students and parents is just a really, really valuable thing for teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, any type of collaboration tool, most of us have gotten very used to using the Google apps where we can, we share things on a Google doc and becoming, uh, really limber with some type of a tool like that. Um, or whether it's something that's more of a work-based thing like Slack, where you're communicating with your coworkers through right. some sort of a system, any type of collaboration tools, I think are also another, uh, really good sort of first step. Um, and then probably the most useful in terms of teaching right now would be the tools that allow us to do flipped and blended learning. And that's everything from a platform to actually store and organize the stuff to, to give kids access to, here's a lesson on this, here's a lesson on this. And then you can really personalize and differentiate that way to the tools to create those lessons themselves, screencasting tools. When, right. That was really my first love of technology. That's the first thing that busted me out of the Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, you know, basic internet, you know, yeah. hat trick of like, I, that's all the tech I know how to do, um, was learning how to do a screencast video. And all of a sudden I thought, oh my gosh, I could do a screencast video on anything. I could, sh- I could make a, 
make a PowerPoint and run the slideshow and, and do a lecture. I can show people how to like do stuff online. And I just, I was so addicted to making videos for things. So learning how to do that process, how to create a video and edit it and then distribute it somehow, whether it's through YouTube or something, it's super empowering for teachers because we've got so many teachers out there who have all this knowledge and the idea that in 2019, you would have to manually deliver that knowledge to people face to face every single time is just right. like, no, you need to do it once really well. And then you can replicate it over and over again. So those kids can benefit from it over and over again. So, um, those would be some of the biggies that I would say, and, you know, kind of curation tools, collaboration tools, and the, all of the different flipped and blended learning, um, tools would be really, really essential, I think, for, for any teacher to be learning. Now, let's say that I teach math and mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, like what kids can do in terms of final products with those tools. So as a teacher, you know, I'm used to giving math problems and we solve them together and maybe we'll do like a word problem and they have to, you know, draw in all this information they've already learned. So mm -hmm. how can I incorporate something like, you know, flipped learning or some kind of curation tool in my classroom? Um, well, let me think about for, for, for flipped learning, especially with math, because math, the lessons are so sort of discrete and here is the skill and here's how you do it. And here's some examples. So I feel like math really lends itself well to flipped and blended learning because you just, you stick your lectures on videos and you get them nice and organized and you can send students to the ones that, uh, pertain to the skill area that they need. Um, and then in terms of like a final product for students, um, something like a curation tool could be great for a math pro product in terms of students connecting what they're learning to stuff that's going on in the real world, whether it's just sort oh, of collecting yeah. examples maybe. Um, because with curation tools, you can be collecting images, you can be collecting news articles, you can be collecting, you know, videos. And so, you know, having students gather maybe evidence from the real world of this math concept, that could be one way um, of doing that. Well, that's synthesizing too, mm -hmm. what they've learned, you know, and a lot of times they wonder what's the point of this, especially yeah. in math. If you're not adding or multiplying like that, they're like, why do I mm -hmm. need algebra? When am I mm -hmm. going to use this? So I could see how, you know, if you tell them that they need to curate 10 examples from the real world in any mm -hmm. form of media, um, that would then create that aha moment for them. Like, Oh right. wow, this really does apply. Yeah. You know, and the, um, two of my favorite math teachers out there, um, Matt Vaudry and John Stevens, they wrote a book called the classroom chef. And one of the things that they talk a lot about is starting a math unit with a problem instead of starting by teaching them the math. And they do these crazy things like a Barbie zip line, <laughs> trying to figure out how to get a Barbie from the roof of the school down to the ground at the highest velocity. And so they don't even start with the math. They start by having the kids try to figure out how they do it. And then they bring in the math later. And so I could see them having students actually use tools like screencasting tools right. to show how they solved this problem and actually like show the math that they used or something almost as a, as like a final presentation or something like that. Right. And, and I can yeah. see how, especially in math, I, I wish that my teacher had used screencasting because I'd see them mm. demonstrate how they did the problem and I'd want them to demonstrate it at least four more times because yes. I was really behind. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. And not, and some kids get it one time and they're like, I got it. Stop talking. Let me go and do it. And then right. other kids are too embarrassed to ask for that repeat. Right. So they just sort of sit there. And then there's that awful feeling where you just zoned out for a second when the teacher was lecturing, you missed that really one important part. And maybe it's the kind of teacher that's got that kind of personality. It's like, well, sorry, you weren't listening. Right. Good I, luck. I covered it. You know, and then you're embarrassed and then you're just like, yeah. And to have that on a video somewhere where you could just go back on your own and review it. So yeah, so many more kids would do better in math if they just had that at their disposal. That's true. Mm. Now you are awesome because you've created a lifeline for teachers um, who want to use tech meaningfully, not just here's all the cool things that I can do, but in a way that's going to impact my students in a positive way. So could you tell us a little more about that? Yes, it is. Uh, it is my online course. It is called Jumpstart. 
And I originally created it for teachers who were kind of a little tech phobic and kind of, and that's why it's called Jumpstart to really give them hands on experiences with 10 different types of technology and show them how to use it in the classroom. Since I created it and we've had, you know, hundreds of students go through it or teachers, I've realized that there are a lot of people with tech experience that have taken it just because they want to fill some gaps in or they just want to have a more comprehensive look. So the um, I built this course the same way that I learned educational technology, which was um, we had to create our own uh, blogs and we had to do projects sort of as if we were students. And so the, the students in Jumpstart, the teachers, mm -hmm. they um, they create things as if they were, uh, the student using the technology. So it's built on 10 modules. Um, and rather than the modules being tools, they're processes. It's built on 10 different processes. So that way, because the tools every year, the tools change. And so right. really if, if it's like the first module is blogging, basic blogging, it's, it's understanding how, what the back end of a blog looks like. And this is where the, the teachers set up their course blog, where they're going to actually be submitting their assignments. Um, and, and once you understand that, then you start to realize, oh, I could do all kinds. I could do my teacher website this way. I could start to become an education blogger or whatever right. it is that once you understand that framework, you can really just run from there. So then we have other modules. Um, one is on curation where the teachers have to actually use a curation tool and put together a collection as if they were a student who got that as an assignment. Uh, we've got a screencasting module where teachers have to make a screencast video. In that case, they're being the teacher in that, that one. There's a podcasting module. There is a uh, digital mind mapping where we're using some digital mind mapping tools to create um, graphic representations of ideas. Um, there is a collaboration module. There is a flipped learning module. Uh, Hyperdocs. Oh, nice. Um, mm -hmm. There's one on QR codes that shows teachers how to actually like use the QR code concept to make physical objects in their classroom kind of come alive with audio and video and, and other sort of attachments. Um, it's a it's a it's a really great course, I think, because it's hands on. Right. Um, you're not just learning about stuff. You actually have to try it. Um, and, and we really require that teachers be thinking through how this is going to, um, support really deep learning in the classroom as opposed to just doing something that's cool. And so a lot of times the students in the course have to resubmit things cause they kind of oh. just did something that was sort of, it's, um, in order to get a certificate of completion, you have to submit your blog. And then I've got a team of people that, um, sort of score them. And it's sort of pass fail, but you won't, you don't get that certificate of completion unless you have sort of done the course with integrity in terms of like really, um, creating good lessons basically. Right. Cause what the idea is we want these teachers to be able to take this stuff back to their classrooms and use it and, and use it really thoughtfully. Yeah. Right. Um, there's two different versions of the course. Um, jumpstart basic is open all year long. It's self-paced. The teacher can jump in tomorrow and just start doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I've got a plus version jumpstart plus, which right. is uh, cohort based. We've got, um, an online forum that teachers join. I've got a calendar of deadlines. It's eight weeks so that you actually stay on track and get it done. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's a forum where people can go in and ask questions and the mentors can, can help them. These are people that have already gone through the course. They did really well. And now mm -hmm. I've hired them as as, as mentors to help. So, um, jumpstart plus is only open five times a year. And right. you and I are talking right now in June, the July cohort is about to open. Um, it's going to be open from June 23rd to July 3rd. And then we get started on July 8th. So, um, anybody listening that is interested in the July cohort right now would be a good time to do that. Right. And where can they find that? They can find it. I am hesitant to click right now because I don't want to dump our call, but I'm going <laughs> to, I have to look at it. I believe it's cultofpedagogy.com slash teachable, but I don't actually, now that I say that I'm wrong, let me look at it one more time. It's cultofpedagogy.teachable.com. Okay. If they go there, they will see there's Jumpstart Basic and Jumpstart Plus. And I will put 
that link in the show notes, you guys, so that you can easily access that. And, you know, I honestly think the cohort would be better because I've signed up for online courses before that I didn't yeah. finish and yeah. life happened or school started. Mm -hmm. So this is great in terms of accountability and the tools that you have on there, the processes that you have on there. Um, some of them I already use and I know that they're amazing. So I, I can't wait for my listeners to, to sign up for this course. Yeah, I hope they will. Um, we've all, I do also the teacher's guide to tech every year. It comes out every January. Um, and people that sign up for jumpstart plus get a little discount on the, on the tech guide if they want to add that to the course, it's not, uh, required for the course to have that, but that's, that's my like encyclopedia of tech tools to make it quick and easy for teachers to find what they need. Um, and it breaks down tech tools into like 40 different categories of what they do. So it just makes right. it really fast for them to find those. Okay. So apart from the jumpstart course, where else can my listeners get more valuable content from you? Uh, if they go to cultofpedagogy.com, that is where I have everything. I have classroom products and my blogs and everything. And that's, there's links to my podcast. I've got a 124 episodes now of my podcast that I've been doing for years and years. So if they're a listener of yours and they've never heard mine, there's all that for them too. Your, po your podcast and also Angela Watson's were the two that mm -hmm. got me inspired. And I have already binge listened to your podcast. So I highly recommend that one to you guys. You need to subscribe to that. Oh, and, um, and also, you know, I've been, I've been following your blog for a while as well. And so I've gotten a lot of great ideas. I recently did one of your narrative units that you sell on Teachers Pay Teachers because oh, right. I'm terrible at teaching narrative. And I said, Kim, you need to suck it up and figure this out. And did it work okay for yes, you? Yes, my students loved it. And it just made it so much easier for me to describe all the different parts of a narrative. Like in my mind, yeah. I know what should be there, but I couldn't extrapolate that into parts. So thank you for that resource. <laughs> oh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to know that you used it. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things to teach. So I'm glad I could help. <laughs> Yay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Jennifer. I really appreciate it. Thank you too. Thanks so much for having me on. Okay, you guys, I told you that that was going to be an awesome episode. I don't know about you, but... I love talking to Jennifer and learning from all of the wisdom that she has to share with us. So here's some of my key takeaways. First of all, I love that she talked about backwards design, about thinking about not just, you know, what are all the fun things that you can do with technology, but where does it actually fit into your lesson? So you want to think about the end first. What do you want your students to learn? What do you want them to demonstrate? And then think of, you know, what lessons you're going to teach so they can kind of master skills in order to reach that end. And then where does the technology fit into that? I think it's really important that way you're not just using tech for the sake of using tech, but it's very purposeful. And sometimes you don't even need technology in certain parts of your unit. You just need it for parts that students couldn't do without the tech, for example, doing any kind of curation or research. I also really appreciated that she talked about some of the different tools that she thinks are impactful, such as curation, such as blogging. A lot of teachers have been blogging, and if you haven't started, you know, there's never a better time to start blogging, and even having your students blog. I've actually had my students blog, and it kind of upped the ante, and it made what they were writing more purposeful and they really took it seriously because they're like oh there's going to be an audience who's going to read what i'm writing so when it came to me asking them to proofread and i was like nah you know your spelling's wrong on that your capitalization isn't quite right there they understood that there were, it was high stakes because it was going to be put out into the public so you know, blogging is something else that I think is really um, impactful, both as teachers and for students. Also, if you're kind of risk averse in terms of technology and you're thinking, oh, I'm kind of scared of it, I'm worried about what the students are going to do when they have it. It's just like having anything else in your classroom. If you handed out markers to your students for a project, they could color on the desk. They could color on each other. But what are you doing that's keeping them engaged? How are you monitoring the classroom? 
what type of a relationship do you have with the students so that they're not coloring on everything? And so the same thing goes with te the technology. What are you doing so that students aren't compelled to you know, play a game or message each other? Now, don't get me wrong, students will, no matter what. But in my classroom, they have fewer opportunities to do that because of the way that I pace my lessons. So I really wanna emphasize the importance of her Jumpstart course. I really think that, especially as a new teacher, in this time of the year, you know, at the time of the recording, it's summer, there's no better time for this type of professional development. And the fact that you have to submit assignments makes it so that there's some accountability there so that it's not just another course that you're gonna sweep under the rug and do someday. And even better is her Jumpstart Plus because it's the cohort of other teachers and there's that sense of camaraderie, there's that sense of we're all in this together and we're helping each other out. And I think that if you were to take these 10 modules that are in her course that go through different processes of you know, thinking about technology, you're gonna start off the year and you're gonna be so pumped and ready to use even a few of them into your teaching. You don't necessarily have to use all 10 at once, but you're gonna find that you can create far more engaging and impactful lessons if you're using the technology that she mentions in this course, or not just mentions, that she teaches in this course. So I definitely want you to head over to teachersneedteachers.com forward slash jumpstart and you can find out more information about that. Now I want you to know that the sign up for this is a fairly short window of time. You have until June 23rd, which was yesterday, all the way until July 3rd. And after that, doors are closed for the cohort. And you guys, this isn't going to open up again until October. And you know, as well as I do, that trying to take a course while also doing back to school stuff, not as ideal. The best time for professional development is during the summer. So you should jump on this right now and head over to teachersneedteacher.com forward slash jumpstart. And remember, you deserve to know how to use this technology and feel confident about it. Also think about when you're having your evaluations and when other teachers are observing you and here you are as a first, second or third year teacher and you're using technology in these innovative ways. That's definitely gonna impress your colleagues and your administrators. And also think about the types of engaging lessons that you can create for your students if you know how to not only use them, I mean, it's one, thing to know how to use technology, but how to purposefully plan with that technology. That just takes it to another level. So again, that website is teachersneedteachers.com forward slash jumpstart. So thank you again for hanging out with me today. I know that you got so much out of this episode and I really thank Jennifer for coming on and taking the time to do this. And I really hope that you guys have a fabulous week.